to the very lecture hangout with uh, Mr. Goldsberry on Google Plus. We've got people from all of our campus here participating. I'm posting the YouTube address now to student area so that and to the faculty so that people can uh, watch live if they want to. I hope that that uh, worked. So uh, here we are. Mr. Goldsberry, thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, and, it's great uh, to be back. Yeah. <laughs> so I wonder if uh, you could just catch us up on what you uh, talked about in your lecture. So for the people that weren't there, maybe they can understand what it was that was so interesting to everybody. Sure. Last Tuesday, I attempted to disprove hell in 30 minutes. I think I did it successfully. We don't have 30 minutes tonight, so I'm going to try to do it in about one minute. Okay. So the premise on which the entire argument hinges is that free will does not exist. And by free will, I mean essentially a free desire, free choice. Uh, that is to say, what it is I want to do is within my control if I have free will and vice versa. I don't feel that I have a choice to over what I desire or what I want, that, the, that the, my wants and my desires, rather than me choosing them, they actually come to me from without, and I am essentially a slave to my desires. And so whatever it is I do, if it stems from what I want to do, is not in my control either. So I can do whatever I want to do, but that's it. That's all I can do. All I can do is what I want to do, and I can't control my wants, so I can't control what I do. If I can't control what I do, then I have no what I will call ultimate moral responsibility. Right? I can't be said to be ultimately at fault for the things that I do. And if that's the case, then I can never be said to deserve punishment. Retribution, that is to say, the attributing of punishment unto someone who has done something wrong simply because we say that the person deserves to be punished becomes a bankrupt notion. Right? Um, the notion of desert becomes empty and bereft of meaning. So I don't deserve to be punished. The only rationales that are left over for punishment in a world in which free will doesn't exist would be um, utilitarian rationales, right? Reasons that would bring about a greater good in the long run. So if I am dead, uh, God has a couple of options. God could either subject me to a punishment after I cease to exist. But at that point, there's no way that I can... I can't become a better person as a result of that punishment. I can't, quote-unquote, learn a lesson as a result of that punishment. So at that point... The only rationale for punishing me after I am deceased would be um, a retributive rationale. And if we don't have free will, then retribution is unethical. So it's, it's a more sophisticated, nuanced argument than just to say that God would never do something mean like send somebody to hell, uh, although I do think that that's the case. Uh, essentially, to run through it one more time, no free will. No free will implies that there's no moral responsibility. No moral responsibility implies that I can't deserve punishment. And if I can't deserve punishment, then the notion of punishment, as a result of which I cannot uh, achieve redemption or improve the world in which I will continue to exist after I've received the punishment, it ain't Fascinating. cool. It ain't cool. So that's the argument. Not for that, uh, I've had silence. The uh, folks here uh, entering the Vermont lounges. You uh, may know if you're watching this, uh, we're all over campus right now. Mr. Sarah is joining us uh, from Savoy. Danilo, I don't know where you are. She's in Savoy as well. Okay. Noah's, I think, downstairs in Vermont. And uh, I think Mr. Uh, Goldsbury is coming to us from his, from his office. So this is really neat. We're using Google Plus uh, Hangout uh, broadcast. Uh, live on YouTube. I don't know if anybody's watching this. I hope they are. But uh, I wanted to open it up. Uh, thank you all for joining us, for being a part of this, uh, panelists. So go ahead and ask a question. Why don't we... Uh, uh, I have a question. Join. So, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Dara. Okay, well, um, Mr. Goldberg, you, you talked about... Um, us not having free will. Um, I don't quite agree with that. Uh, how could you explain that further, this, this idea of not having free will? Because I think we do have free will. Okay. I would say that in order for myself to have something that I would regard to be free will, I would have to cause myself to have a desire 
that um, I didn't have prior to my causing myself to have that desire. I would say that I don't choose what I desire, I don't choose what I want, and that any action that I do is a result of my having had a stronger desire to do that action than any other action that I could have done at that moment in time. And so, sure, I can do anything that, I mean, I, I choose right now to drink water because it's refreshing and it helps me speak with a more luscious baritone. But I would say that I had an irresistible urge to drink that water right when I drank it. So I wouldn't say the fact that I can do whatever I want to do demonstrates that I have free will. In a way, it, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate the opposite either. But um, in order for me to feel compelled that I did have such a thing as free will, I would have to be able to turn my desires on a dime, so to speak. Uh, and I, I can't do that. Maybe other people can. So I'd be curious to know what you have to say in response. Yeah, well, well what I think is like we don't have a... And we cannot control what we want to do, but we, we, we can control what we end up doing, right? So I want to say, for example, I want to, do, I want to drink water. That's my feelings. And my, my body is telling me, you need to drink water. But I can say, no, I'm not going to do that, right? Okay. So I end up not drinking water. My choice is not to drink water for some reason. Exactly. That's right. I think those who believe in such a thing as free will think that on one, hand, on one hand I have desires, things that I want to do, and on the other hand I have things that I know intellectually that I ought to do. And so then I, I try to restrain my desire and do what I ought to do in spite of what I want. But I think that what we're doing is we're referring to two competing desires that are equally desire-ish. I mean, like, so the fact that, Alvaro, you wouldn't drink water in a certain moment would mean that you had a stronger desire not to drink water than you did to drink water. And so I would say that ultimately anytime you do something or don't do something it's because you either did or did not have a desire to do that thing. And it may be the case that we're having what, what, excuse me, what philosophers would refer to as a verbal dispute and that we're just arguing semantics. We're just arguing. Yeah, so if I could, if I could just interject a moment. I mean, maybe we could, uh, I don't know if Noah, a question about whether or not free will exists, but maybe for the sake of this argument, we could just assume that free will does not exist and move on from there. I mean, is that a fair uh, request for the sake of moving the discussion along in terms of the notion of retribution? Yes, to continue the conversation, that would be necessary. And Go ahead, just Noah, why don't you ask the question then based upon that assumption? Um, well, if we didn't have free will, and if we didn't have the cause to do this, then simply there would be no will to live in person's body. Therefore, there would be no will to get to either heaven or hell. So why, if we don't have free will, do we kind of continue forward in a path which is already put out for us, which is free will or not free will? By a path that is put out for us, do you mean to say that? Fate. Hey, just world, to make it simple. Oh, in, um, oh fate. Oh, okay. Yes, just to make it simple. Just okay. Simple. Okay. Well, yeah, it 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 does seem like a something of a paradox, right? That if I if I learn that I don't have free will, that I may as well just lie around in bed all day, and not get out of bed, and not do anything. And that's your choice. That is that is in, in, and and ultimately, well. in, in the fullness of time I would look back and say, Well, I guess that's what I was fated to do. You know, my my, my fate was to, to learn that I had no control over my fate and therefore I just became, you know, uh, a lethargic sloth of a human being and I didn't do anything good for society. I just you know <laughs> but, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I I don't know, it's an interesting point. I don't I haven't responded to my discovery that we don't have free will, and the way that you describe, one might, uh, but that is a common reaction. Uh, they, you know, they they find the notion that there is no such thing as free will to be uh, depressing. And I, I actually take solace in it myself. Uh, I find that, uh, you know, I am I'm more forgiving of myself. I, I I like to think that it would make a person more humble with regard to their own successes and uh, more forgiving with regard to their own failures and to the failures of other people. Uh, and it, uh, in, at least in, in my experience, it has generated a notion that people are owed the benefit of the doubt, and I see them through a lens of assuming that they're doing the best that they can. And so I do believe that it ought to, if it's properly understood, this notion that there is no such thing, should make us kinder, gentler people. 
uh, and not necessarily lazier, less likely to get out of bed kinds of people. If we have no goal, how do you think Marxism collapsed to the whole system of Marx where people were like, I have no reason to live, I have no reason to be here, everything's just given to me, technically saying that I have no free will, therefore I don't need to do anything because it's basically already planned out, that you'll just collapse, the system will collapse, you will collapse as a person. I don't know that I know enough about Karl Marx to be able to I, answer I that effectively. I do, so I want to add a little bit. I can interpret it. I would say the, the perfect world the, to the point where everyone would uh, pitch into what they would need to do and then take uh, freedom and liberties and all of the higher living kind of things like the arts and the and like doing what you want to do. So I kind of interpret it a little differently. I don't see it as something that would collapse. It was done perfectly as he imagined it to do. Mm. So that's... Thank you. Oh, this is Ms. Kantz, by the way. Hi. She's just joining us in the, uh, in the uh, Google Hangout. And we are streaming this live, and I have been getting notes from people that are watching this, in fact. It's uh, fascinating that this is happening. I think we're, uh, yeah, someone's sitting over here watching it. Oh, cool. So uh, we are live, and, and this is uh, Mr. Goldsberry's uh, Hellbusters lecture. And uh, follow up. We're talking about free will, and if there is no free will, um, do we deserve punishment? And that's an interesting point that Mr. Goldsberry just brought up, that um, in fact we could be better people if we all assumed that no one was responsible uh, for his or her own actions. But I think what Noah is saying then is that if yeah. no one is responsible for his or her own actions, then doing whatever we please then could quickly lead to anarchy. Is that, is that kind of... Pretty much the solid, the solid remark right there, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment on that briefly. I, um, when I first had this epiphany, I mean, it was I, actually, I remember the year in my life in which I began to think that this was all true, this whole like no free will thing. And I thought, well, up until that point, I thought if we didn't have free will and I was not responsible for what I did, then uh, I could not be held responsible for, um, you know, a shooting spree that I myself would be the the gunmen uh, in the midst of, you know, like the, the, the Boston Marathon shooters, we, we would have to throw up our hands and say, well, you know, they were uh, captives of irresistible urges to create bombs out of household objects and maim hundreds of people. Uh, and, I mean, I, that, that's true in a sense, and yet at the, on, on the other hand, um, what's difficult to, um, to understand and to articulate is the reason whereby that is true, and yet at the same time we are entirely justified in going on a manhunt and throwing these people in a place where they cannot hurt people any longer. Uh, and the notion that we have non-retributive reasons for punishment, that I could say, I don't think this person deserves to be punished, but I still think that they sh should be punished or that they need to be, and here's why. Fascinating. Uh, Danilo, we haven't heard from you. Why don't you go ahead? Do you have something to, uh, you want to ask? His mic's off. Um, uh, turn, turn your microphone on. I have on. a question Mr. from this side, though, Mr. Kanz. Mr. Kanz, we have a question here. Okay, well, while Danilo's getting his mic, uh, go ahead, Savoy. Okay, so, Mr. Goldsberry, so you are trying to disprove hell. What, uh, what about, in the other hand, disproval of heaven? So if there is no hell, is there paradise nice. in heaven? I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I think that's Noah saying that his, his brain is in lockstep with yours. I'm really glad that someone asked about heaven. Because uh, it's often asserted that heaven and hell sort of go together and that if you're going to eliminate one, then you're by default eliminating the other and that it's a package deal. Yeah. And that if I don't deserve hell, because that is my claim, right, then uh, in what sense do I deserve heaven? And if I don't deserve heaven, then have I also disproved heaven? No. I don't think I have. And the reason for that is I'm interested in, um, well, <laughs> I almost said I'm interested in a God who does X, you know, like, like God has to pay any attention to my silly arguments. But, but if God is out there and God is paying attention to my silly arguments, then I hope that God is interested in a world in which pain is minimized and pleasure is maximized yeah. by and large um, and in which there is value added, right? Um, I don't enjoy the notion of any of my friends or even any of my enemies languishing for an eternity in a bad place. However, if God sees fit to 
not necessarily as a reward, but simply as value added to say, you know what, I, it is better for there to be an afterlife in which pleasure obtains than it is for there not to be an afterlife in which pleasure obtains. Then that's the only reason that God needs. Uh, so I would never, I, I, I'm not saying that I've proved heaven. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying that there's, you know, I can't think of any good reason why God shouldn't do that if that's what God chose to do. So, uh, and on my best days, I, you know, I do have a hope for something like that. <laughs> Only on your best days. Only on, <laughs> my, my degree of faith, the percentage of likelihood that I would attribute to my own faith in terms of like, how likely do I think it is that there is a supreme being? How likely do I think it is that there's a heaven? You know, that, that percentage fluctuates, um, you know, depending on if I'm having a good day or a bad day. Um, Love it. Okay, Danilo, is your microphone working? No, it is not. <laughs> Do you know sign language, Danilo? You can write it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Follow-up questions from anybody else. I, I'm curious um, if nobody else has a question. I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, for example, in a, I don't. I'm not sure in a Protestant faith, but in Catholic faith, what is about the purgatory? Mm. So the because the, the soul goes to the heaven, but between is a purgatory that you should have burned all your sins that you have done. So what is, that? What did, is you, it? did you? Did, I'm sorry. Did you just say purgatory? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. What about purgatory then, Goldsberg? I'd be interested in anyone else chiming in about purgatory. Actually, before I say my piece about it, I I, I have some things to say, but. I don't know, what does someone else out there in this hangout think about this concept of purgatory? It, well, can I maybe try and articulate my understanding of it? Uh, it's a place where uh, a person goes and sins uh, are, what, you, you sort of way into heaven, you sort of have a, like a probationary go to heaven? But you work them off. Some versions are you work them off, is it not? Like or maybe it's time. I'm not sure. Carlo has a quite um, 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 appropriate definition. Go, Carlo. Go. Oh, the purgatory. The purgatory uh, is a place like the where the people like uh, when they die, they will go. They wouldn't go directly to the heaven or to the hell. First, because they have to achieve the goal of the um, we call it in the church the burning sins. So for mm -hmm. every uh, we have definition that for. Every sin that you have done, you have a um, certain amount of years that you have to like uh, suffer, not suffer, but uh, work on those on a path that you have to like be clean of your sins. Mm -hmm. So if you have like if you have the if you have um, Thank you failed, you go to hell, and if you have achieved that goal, you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So that that time that you spend is that considered sort of in your mind being Catholic as a punishment because you're not in heaven yet? Uh, no, in, as a Catholic, uh, we consider it as a fair because our life isn't sinless. Ah, so, so it's a cleansing. Sin. It's Sorry? a cleansing. Can you repeat, please? A cleansing of yourself before. Somewhere pure like heaven? Yes. But uh, the person has to achieve, the, you have to clean itself before going to hell. But if, because if it fails, it goes to hell. That's the, the, like the definition of, uh, of a purgatory. But uh, it, it's not like for a short amount of time. Because like it's like for a years and years, like after... Uh, we have definition like afterlife, so you like spend thousands thousands of years just cleaning yourself of the of the sins that you have you, that you mm. have committed. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, Good. Go ahead, Mr. Goldsberry. Sure. What I guess say? I guess what I'd say to that is that if such a thing as cleansing is necessary, I would want God to do said cleansing in as least unpleasant a way as possible. <laughs> yeah, in thousands of years. Yeah, or even 10 minutes. Uh, you know, I, I, it's an interesting point, though. I mean, I, some people would say that, um, you know, free, free will. Okay, in the traditional understanding of free will, that is to say, like, look at my free will. I'm lifting 
lifting this glass up and moving it side to side to prove how free I am. Okay, I do have that kind of freedom. And some people think that a violation of that kind of freedom is like the worst thing that God could ever do. Uh, and so for God to, after I die, like change me without my having an opportunity to resist that change uh, would, be, would be evil, right? Uh, so, you know, let's like, say I am a bad person, so to speak, and after I die, God changes my, my mind, God alters my desires in such a way that I'm, one might even say, not even the same person, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, no pain is entailed in that, but some might say that it's, you know, it's evil, it's unforgivable, because I lost autonomy in that process. <laughs> so first, we let, should, me, we should, let me just uh, hi. Let me just chime in quickly. I know Didillo's got a question. You, I have something quick. You, you, you mentioned you're, you're you're mentioning God in this in, in your argument. What do you does that represent? Does, do, what is what is God to you? Do, I mean, do you have a, a a notion of what that or who that is, or or do you just sort of use that as an intellectual argument, or do you in fact believe that there is a God in the Christian sense, or the Muslim sense, mm. or the Judaic sense? I think it would be any, well, I define it as any supreme being uh, who can do any logically possible thing. Uh, to say that God can do anything would be to imply that God can do a few things that I don't think that any God could be able to do, like make a square circle, make two and two add up to five, or uh, sin. So, for instance, like if you know, some people say that God cannot sin. So that if, like if God were to commit murder, then that would make murder good, or that would make that, that particular murder good. Uh, but I, uh, and that, that that's another hangout, maybe yeah. another topic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that that's good. Noah, uh, has got a question, and I want to hear from Danilo, and everybody's got to go to study hall. So we'll uh, we'll uh, have a couple more questions, and then wrap this up. But go ahead, uh, Noah. It, it was God's will for the manifest of destiny for the Americans to literally slaughter millions and millions of Native Americans. And then again, it was God's will to slaughter Afghanis in the Afghani region. So again, who's committing genocide? Is it the people? Is it God? Or is it a personal perspective on God's will? It's a great point. I don't know who's trying to buzz in here, but here's, here's what I think you're... Uh, implying, Noah, is that if, um, if we don't have free will and there is a God and God is all-powerful, then, by, def then you know, by default, then, whatever happens is, in, is, so is something that's happening in accordance with God's will. Uh, and, and this really is a, a topic that I'd love to talk about later on, um, not in this chat, unfortunately, but the notion that you know, what is God doing if God is all-powerful and just like sits back and watches these horrendous things happen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well then let's uh I'm making a note of that. Why do bad things happen? Next uh Goldsbury hangout. Uh all right, go ahead, Danilo. <laughs> can we hear can we hear Danilo? <laughs> oh can't hear Danilo. Bummer. Straight Bummer Danilo. Do you know what you can do? Actually, you can chat with me. Do you see the, the screen over there? Um there's a, there's Otherwise, Danilo, Danilo, you can come down here to the fourth floor and then just click chat. Through. Just click chat and type me a question, yeah. and I'll read it. Danilo, come here. Actually, that's something we could do next time too. If people have questions and they're watching this live on you, if you're watching this right now and you have a question, send me an email or or something uh, to my LAS account, and I'll read it quickly. And we've we got about two minutes left. Danilo is furiously typing, <laughs> and. Uh, Okay, Nimo, um, I have a little question slash comment. So, um, um, Mr. Goldsberry, you uh, talk about God, but you, you mention it in plural. So, you believe in more than one entity that you, like, you know, a um, entity that you call God, like more than one? I may have referred to God using a plural pronoun, but if I did, it was a slip of the tongue. I don't think I meant to refer to God as they. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, another, another little comment, uh, you were, you know, we were talking about what is bad and what is good, and the fact that God, um, we presume that he's letting, or she's letting bad things happening, but what is bad and what is good, maybe we can, we, can, we can distinguish between good and bad, because there is bad and there is good. If there wasn't good or bad, then how could we tell? If everything was good, then the, mm -hmm. you still will have to distinguish between good and bad, right? Yeah, no, yeah, that is, uh, 
that's a great insight, and I can't unpack that until we have our next hangout about why God lets bad things happen. Oh, uh, we should get we should get a meeting for that next hangout. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I apologize. Concerned. Someone I think is trying to get in on this. Oh, it's Vala. Vala wants to be in on this. <laughs> but uh, that's good. I'm I'm getting a lot of traffic now. I, I tried to invite Vala earlier and. He uh, couldn't get him on, so that's a bummer. He wants to be a part of this. Burke just asked a question, of course. Burke was at the uh, at the original lecture, and he wants to know, he emailed me, uh, what is the path to heaven? You described getting to heaven, and he wants to know if there is a path to heaven. I don't know if that's, that's you know, a, uh, a question that could take a lifetime to answer, but uh, I just wanted to get out to Burke here. He did ask a question. So, I mean, that, Goldsberry, you, you were talking earlier about that, that even though that there is no, in your mind, uh, you know, justification for hell or, or a hell, in fact, at all, mm -hmm. there is, if there is a loving God, uh, a a concept of heaven or, or a, you know, uh, help me out. What you were saying yeah. earlier about heaven? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I have a more complex and maybe even less believable argument about the kind of heaven that God would create for every individual person, uh, I think it might be different for everyone. Uh, and that as long as you desired a particular kind of heaven, then God doesn't have a very good reason for not allowing that to be your perception of reality in the afterlife. And maybe God creates a different heaven for everyone. Um, or, or, or maybe we don't like that idea very much, that people whose idea of heaven in this life, like you know, maybe you have some oppressive dictator who would love to spend an, an eternity continuing to be an oppressive dictator. And... If that's the case, then is that the kind of afterlife that God should let this dictator lead? Uh, I uh -huh. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm now. This is really good. Uh, Burke Burke as a follow up. You die and you go to heaven. The path between them. Okay. Uh, yeah, we got that. Thank you, Burke. Um, Danilo's question is now in the sidebar. If you ah, want to did he okay. Thanks, Danilo. Um, Danilo asks, so, I did come to the library talk, but I had no idea on what basis you tried to disprove hell. What would your comment be on any, any biblical notion of hell? Wow. Well, well, let me just, before you start on that answer, go to library.la. Click on, you can read. Mr. Goldsberry's notes from his last Tuesday. Yeah, and I'll try uh, to remember to share them with the student area as well. Yeah. Well, biblical images of hell exist in their most violent incarnations in portions of the New Testament. Um, that you know, in, in the Old Testament, there's a place called Sheol. It's like there's a place that you or your soul goes after you die, but it's not necessarily a bad place. It is a dark place. It might not be especially pleasant, but it's just kind of like. Meh. Um, and you don't get that fire and brimstone. This is your everlasting punishment for being disobedient to God or being a sinful human being during your actual on earth life. That idea is a very New Testament ish idea. And I do find it peculiar that there is no hell in the, um, the classic sense of hell that, that you picture from Dante and Jesus himself in the Gospels talking about the unquenchable fire and all kinds of really unpleasant images. Um, and so then all of a sudden you get Jesus, who is Jewish, comes along and then, according to Christian theology, is going to save us from this place that his own religious tradition didn't really believe in until relatively recently. So uh, it, it, it's, it's quite a mystery to me. But I would say that my disproof of hell, if it works, disproves even, especially the worst kinds of hell, including those that are portrayed in the New Testament. Uh, Noah's got one more. I think we should probably cut this off in a minute, but I'm, I want to uh, give people a um, uh, an opportunity. Uh, they've asking questions stuff from Oliver, from Sakina. They want to know uh, about well, Sakina's got about um, what do you say to to those who are devout and who who have certain beliefs um, that may not be in line with yours? How do you uh, differences in opinion? Um, mm. you know, engage in debate with, without risking being um, uh, insensitive? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, the answer that I would give is that uh, as a result of the argument that I've presented, actually, um, which has its basis in the notion that 
we don't choose what we desire to do, and I also don't think that we have any choice about what we believe. Um, I would say that I'm doing the best that I can to try to figure out what's true, uh, what's the ultimate truth about the you know the world and about the divine, and people who disagree with me, uh, wildly even, are also on that. They're in that same. They've all done the same endeavor. They're also trying very hard to find out what's true, and we're all trying equally hard. We're using the brain that God gave us or that we evolved to possess, and we arrive at different answers. And I think that it's important to be humble about the fact that you know the answer that I think is true. I could wake up tomorrow and realize, oh, I don't know what I was thinking. Well, I do, but I you know. I might wake up tomorrow and discover that I'm wrong, uh, yeah. and and so I think that's the kind of intellectual humility that I think we should bring to these these debates. Very nice, very nice. Go ahead, Noah. Um, what if we're currently living in hell? Because after Eden, obviously, cast the first humans to Earth, decided that this is hell actually, and that to reach enlightenment, to reach the final steps, that is actually the gateway to heaven. <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> what if we're how in can hell you look now? out the window? How can you look out the window and say that this is hell, though? No, my my goodness, isn't it? Well, there's suffering. There's death in the Buddhist religion. Technically, we are suffering, wow. and technically, the only escape from the cycle is if we enlighten ourselves. Mm, yeah. And to technically say the worst suffering is death then technically this is hell because the worst suffering as a human we can feel is to die and we're all expected to die at one point. Mm. So why isn't this hell? What is prolonging your own death? I think it's a really interesting question to explore and I think that in order to explore that one we'll have to explore the, 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 the great unanswered question of why is that a, an all-powerful, all-loving God would permit as much terrible evil as the God who hopefully does exist seems to permit nonetheless. So I do hope we have a chance to talk about that uh, in the dining hall, in classrooms, in my office, uh, over cyberspace again very soon. That's to to stop. I, my uh, computer's about to run out of batteries. Anyone hate to lose this incredible uh, conversation that we've had if, uh, for posterity. And I, it's amazing how many folks act. That's terrific. Thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, email and chat and stuff like that. And thanks very much to our panelists. Boy, actually, they're all through. Savoy presenting tonight. Thank you, Savoy, so much for um, for being a for Especially, we we do appreciate the time and uh, the intellectual uh, exercise. This is good. yeah. This is fun. Huh? So Vermont, I'm in the Vermont lounge now for study hall. Every year. Yeah. Uh -huh. we have lots of we Google Hangout every Tuesday at this time. Every Let's be back again here. The every rest Tuesday. of the year. Amen to that. And uh, okay, so with that, let's uh, let's sit online. You can watch it again. Um, you know, you can watch Danilo Strick <laughs> technology. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. Okay. Thanks you all for joining us. Yeah. Thanks again.